Welcome to the Relentless Growth Podcast with Chris Goodman, where business owners and personal growth junkies just like you get their fix of tough questions and powerful coaching conversations so you can become your best, find your purpose, discover new levels of freedom, and lead others in their pursuit of relentless growth. Let's get started. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 22 of Relentless Growth. Can you believe it's already episode 22? Things are picking up and getting busy around our house right now. The um, The holidays are kicking in and we're doing our last you know, pushes for the end of year in our, our quarter four business. So uh, I hope you guys are doing the same and planning, if you haven't already, for how you're going to start 2021 and make it an amazing year. And I also wanted to tell you that I really hope you guys are doing well. I'm seeing more and more of my friends, family, and clients and their friends and families affected by the global pandemic, by COVID, and by the economic fallout and the political fallout that it's causing. And I just wanted to say that I hope you're finding ways, healthy ways, to deal with the stress and the uncertainty in these times. I, I know my coaching clients are using the tools that we work through in coaching and leaning on those things. If you're not getting those tools somewhere, those mechanisms to control how you think, to improve the choices you make, and to enhance the action that you're taking. Uh, please find some resources through my coaching or through other people's coaching to deal with this uncertainty right now. It, it can be very trying, and uh, I trust that you're doing your best. So today, you're going to hear an episode with, uh, an interview rather, with my friend Dirk Van Reenen. And Dirk's been a good friend for six or seven years, I think now. Uh, we met through the Keller Williams world, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Dirk before you hear his interview. And real quick, one moment uh, for housekeeping. Right now, I'm taking on 2021 coaching clients. So if this is you, now is the time to apply. You can find an application at goodmancoachinginc.com, or you can go to Instagram and click on my bio and find it right there at the top of my page. But these spots are one-on-one -on -one spots. These usually go pretty quickly. And I had them all full. I've now moved through the wait list and we're moving on to people who are on that wait list and starting the 2021 batch. So if you want to get to a point where you can control your mindset, you can have more time freedom and more fulfillment in your life, I would recommend you go on and fill out a quick application. It takes three minutes. And uh, here's some results. Like if you're wondering if this is right for you, I always think about my client, David, who clawed back 20 hours a week in his schedule as a CEO and rebuilt his entire calendar, rebuilt his team's calendar and almost doubled their business in less than a year to about almost $2 million. So these spots are for business owners primarily. If you're, if you're not a business owner, I would encourage you to go and at least have a conversation with me and see if it's a fit. But primarily, these are for business owners, existing business owners who want to get that time and freedom back in their life. Or maybe you're like one of my clients who already has an outstanding business, millions of dollars a year in revenue, but just isn't feeling fulfilled. And they need to find new ways to find happiness, real genuine happiness, not just temporary uh, things in their life, but real genuine fulfillment. So if that's you, I invite you to apply today and let's get you set up for one of those 2021 20, spots. My packages typically come in three, six, and 12 month options. And you coach with me one on one every week, so there's no distraction about uh, you know who else you're in the room with. These are one on one spots. I will have a group option later on, and you know stay tuned for details about that. For right now, these are just one on one spots. So, all right, you guys get the point there. Let's talk about Dirk. Dirk is uh, he, like I said, he's just an amazing friend who has over the years continuously grown as a leader, as a father, as a business owner as a founder of businesses. So I really wanted to have him on to explain how his trajectory has changed and challenged him in his growth. And what there's two things I want to tell you. Number one, Dirk is uh, currently the CEO of a company called Bergflow that he started. They specialize in human systems development, which I love the way they say that, human systems development. They essentially have a fascination for how humans work and interact and develop within a business. 
And Bergflow's focus is to uh, help those CEOs, business owners, those leaders build the best business they can by building the best team possible. So Dirk's going to tell you about Bergflow and why he called it Bergflow and the hidden meaning behind that. So uh, stay tuned. That's at the end of the episode. So you want to make sure you track with him the whole time to get that. He's also the co-founder of a company called Inspector Empire Builder. And this is a fascinating company too, because they work directly with home inspectors and help them scale their home inspection business. If you guys know any home inspectors or know anything about residential home inspecting, you know it's a grind. And most of the time, these small business owners, who are typically the inspectors themselves, have no training in how to scale their business. So I love how they they help these men and women get from the crawl space to the CEO space. And it's really great to watch these people change their lives through his company. So between these two companies alone, he'll do over $2 million in revenue this year. So Dirk is on the fast track. And I just wanted to give you some context that he he is an award-winning entrepreneur as well. He's an international business consultant and speaker. He's launched and sold several startup companies. He's been one of the top brokerage CEOs for Keller Williams Realty, which is where I met him. And again, the reason that I wanted him to come on was to tell his story about how he, despite having the success, realized he had a far deeper purpose and that he needed to reevaluate everything he was doing and the path he was on because it wasn't taking him where he wanted to go. He needed to grow in a different direction. So he made some huge changes, including, you know, resigning from his corporate his prestigious corporate CEO position. I mean, this was, you know, I really looked up to him at the time for making the tough choice to step down and follow his passion. So he started these other companies after that, but I'm going to let him tell the story. I just wanted to give you some context that, you know, some people I have on have a tremendous resume and it's hard for them to describe it because they're so humble. They don't really want to acknowledge all the amazing things they've done. So I I need to make sure I edify them appropriately. So listen in. And as always, if you find some real value in what Dirk has to say, or you know someone who needs to hear his wisdom, his experience, his advice, please share it on social media uh, right as you get finished with the episode so you don't forget and help some other people in their pursuit of relentless growth. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the interview. All right, everybody. So Dirk and I have been sitting here literally debating boxers or briefs, but we're not going to subject you to that because the answer is both. (laughs) But I really, first of all, I just want to say thank you, Dirk, for taking some time out of your crazy schedule to share your insight, your wisdom, and your experience with us in the crowd. Yeah, Chris, I'm super excited to be here. I mean, it's always just great to catch up with you anyway. And uh, to do this podcast with you is really exciting. So thanks for having me, brother. My pleasure, man. I'm excited. And for everyone listening, you know, you just heard that introduction, which uh, just doesn't do enough credit. It's hard to say enough good things about Dirk. Dirk's one of the few people who actually drank bourbon with me at my wedding. <laughs> so, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> so we've had a lot of good times together. Uh, we spent a lot of time together over the years, especially, um, you know, as Dirk has grown his businesses, plural. And I want to start to paint the picture. You know, I, I said a few of these things in the intro but if you fast forwarded through that, here's what I want you to know. Like Dirk is the quintessential successful entrepreneur of multiple businesses, and he's gotten there by earning it every step of the way. None of it was handed to him. You know, family man, picture the kind of classic American, you know, two kids, boy and a girl, both adorable, awesome kids, happy wife who's always supporting him. And, you know, this guy who travels the world helping people, doing what he loves, helping them build their dreams. You know, I'm also remembering things like when you you traveled on a kayak through the floodwaters in the Houston area. What was that two years ago? Yeah, that was 2017, three years ago. Three years ago. Yeah. For anybody who's not familiar, Houston had these horrible floods and Dirk literally just rolled out in his kayak and was saving people's lives just because that was the thing he he needed to do. And he thought that was the right thing to do. So when you're not saving lives and building businesses and traveling the world. You're climbing mountains and hanging out with billionaires on planes. Are y'all starting to get the picture here? (laughs) (laughs) You're making it sound way better than what it is, dude. (laughs) 
Well, I, it's funny because I think that's what people really, you know, they think that's daily life because that's some of the fun things that entrepreneurs of your caliber get to do. But that's not necessarily reality, I guess, is it? We talked about this on our team meeting yesterday and just really talked to our whole team. And I said, look, high levels of success is not that sexy. It's actually really boring. It's it's putting your head down and pushing hard enough to break through the ceiling. So, no, it's not. I mean, you know, what you're talking about is the Instagram reel, right? And those moments do come along and they're fun when they do. And they remind you, you know, why it is that you put the hard work in. But for us, it's the blessing in what we do is that we love doing the hard work. You know, we love the, you know, going into projects, coming to the office as a team and just diving in and working hard day in and day out. You know, and obviously we love those peak experiences when you get to have a great event or, you know, you, you get to have a, a great experience with a client or something like that, a big win. But really, I mean, I think the reason that things work well for us is that we've fallen in love with the journey of, you know, building businesses and growing as human beings. And that's what propels us. That might be one of my favorite reasons that I asked you on, because I realized that you have, you know, for a while there, I think everybody, especially that comes from the real estate background, gets hooked on results, right? So you get a good result and you're like, oh, okay, I won. What's next? And you've just kind of notched up every year, not just the results, but the impact that you leave in your wake. And over the last couple of years, as you've built Bergflow and these other organizations, I've just witnessed how you've really enjoyed the process, even though it sucks sometimes, <laughs> you know, because I think every real honest entrepreneur will tell you, like you just said, it's not always, you know, sunshine, rainbows and lollipops. It's real work. But I do appreciate that that's part of your journey is appreciating it along the way. And that's why you're here. So let's get right to it, because I do want people to realize that even though this is your life now and, you know, in, in all metrics, everybody could look at you and say, wow, this dude's wildly successful. That wasn't always the case. And well, I still don't feel wildly successful. Right. I think like that's part of it is that. Oh, really? Dude. Yes. I mean, like, I think all the time, like, oh, my gosh, man, like we, we need to be doing more. We could be doing more. And I, I think a lot of driven people, entrepreneurs struggle with that, that at every level, they still feel like, you know, they're failing somehow, they're not doing well enough. And so it's always some interesting when somebody else says like, oh, you're being very successful because it's like, man, are we? I mean, this is something I work with my clients on every day that, you know, people making $10 million a year feel like they're total failures. <laughs> yeah. My coach <laughs> told me on Monday, he's like, dude, you got to start celebrating more. You got to <laughs> slow down and celebrate every single day. Yeah. Why do you think it's so hard for people who are hardwired like this to do that? I really think because for most people, it's there's a big gap. There's no matter where they are right now, like people may see where you are right now and they may think like, hey, well, where they are right now, like that's a really great level. And yet, if you get inside the mind and emotions of that person, for them, they're always just feeling like they're still scratching the surface. They're always feeling like, man, we're just now starting to build momentum. And it's still so far from where we want to be. So I think like that's why it feels like there's this massive gap because, you know, if you're really driven to succeed, then you're always staying ahead of it with like a big picture, a vision, something you're driving towards. And it never quite feels like it gets there fast enough. You know, my coach worked with me for at least a full year on, dude, you got to slow down. You got to smell the roses. If you don't celebrate these wins, you're going to look up and it's going to be 20 years have gone by and you've been just nose to the grindstone without actually having any fun or being grateful for it. And uh, so I, I really relate to that. I know I've gotten messages on Instagram left and right from people who've talked about, I can't believe how simple everybody makes it. These successful people get on and they say, it's so simple. Just be grateful. Just celebrate your progress. Just have a good time. Have fun with the process itself. Do you think it's that simple? No, I don't think it's that simple. <laughs> <I mean, laughs> look, there are some things and, you know, these are some of the important things. And I know that you kind of started off the journey of like, hey, let's talk about kind of where you came from, because there are things that are fundamental to next level success. And it's one of these things that if you don't understand what the framework looks like, if you don't understand what the, that game looks like and you're playing a different type of game, I don't care how hard you're playing or how well you're playing that game. If you don't know what's required to go to the next level of success, if you're missing foundational pieces, you're not going to get there. So there is an element of like, look, I fully agree with, with the statement you said, like, you got to love the process. You got to, you know, celebrate. But 
Look, I mean, if you aren't learning and growing and developing, you're not going to the next level. And that learning and growing and developing part is that's where you're getting the crap kicked out of you on an ongoing basis, right? That's what's hard. Uh, it's not figuring out how to do a thing, right? I mean, you're figuring out how to run a great podcast here, but running a great podcast is not going to be the thing that propels you to the next level. It's going to be the person that you become while you're running a great podcast, while you're building your coaching business, right? And that's the part that's hard. And that's the part that has some complexity because we never know exactly what is hooking us and holding us back. And you know that's why I, I'm such a proponent of what you do, Chris, with helping people really understand where they are, where they're going, and what's holding them back. Because you know there could be things sometimes that is completely unrelated to work that has deep hooks within you, emotionally and mentally, that's causing you to self-sabotage yourself and really, you know, shutting down that next level of fulfillment and success. And, you know, that's where things get a little bit more complex to understand, okay, where am I? What's holding me back right now? What's working, you know, and, and how can I align things to move me forward? So, you know, that's a long way of saying like, no, I think there's a little bit more to it. And that's why I think the people that succeed ultimately are the people that just always adopt a mindset of being a student and learning you know, more about who they are and the journey that they're on. So when you look back, do you think you always had that mindset of, you know, you got to keep learning, you got to keep growing, or was there something that kickstarted that? Well, I think for me, I mean, as long as I can remember, I've always been driven and I've always been very curious. So I love learning, but I had a kind of a false understanding of what learning is, right? So in the traditional sense, like I'm a terrible student, I hated school. I hated high school. I, the only reason I liked going to college was really for what happened outside of the classroom. So my viewpoint of what traditional learning was, was just flawed. And after college, you know, I already owned a business when I was in college, the ski and snowboard shop that I owned. So for me, I just want to be done with this. And for the rest of my 20s, man, I, I probably read a total of 10 books in my entire 20s. and. Because for me, it was like the idea of like learning, you know, felt like a punishment because of what the traditional school system taught me about learning. So I really rediscovered like my love for learning probably at about 31 years old. That's about eight years ago. And today, you know, it's just been building and building and building because today I love reading. I love listening to audiobooks, podcasts. I love you know, going to conferences when COVID's not going on, but I mean, even digital stuff now, just being in conversations with high-minded people, learning, and, and it's definitely a deep part of who I am today. But I think I've always been learning-based. I just didn't like the traditional way of learning. And I think like, that's one thing that's so sad about the traditional school system and the traditional way of learning is that it sets so many people up for failure in life. And I think especially... You know, a lot of entrepreneurial people are wired a little bit differently. They may have a little bit of ADD and they're independent and a little bit rebellious. And the traditional school system is not set up at all to cater to people like that. So, you know, yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons. Like punish them, right. Yeah. And I mean, we, you know, f that's one of the reasons we earlier this year, even before COVID, as of January, we started homeschooling this year because we want to create a different learning experience for our kids, you know, as they're getting into like a really influential you know, age of learning right now. So, yeah. Well, let me, there's two things that popped up that I want to go back to the ski business in uh -huh. just a second. But first, I know a lot of people love the book recommendations from the guests who come on the show. And if there's anybody who's read a ton of personal growth books, I know it's you. <laughs> so maybe you could just rattle off a couple of the most impactful that you're reading right now, or some that you can, you know, wholeheartedly recommend to people who are just getting into the middle of their growth journey. Okay, so I'll let me start with this. Just some books that I overall recommend and that I think are just really great books. Like, So these are some of the books that we hand out, right? Because uh, we usually order probably, I don't know, 60 or 80 books a month and hand them out to people. So one of the books that I really love is a book called The Alchemist. And uh, it's been around for a while. It's a fable type book, so it's a story. And that's one of the books that I really love. I also like the book, The Four Agreements, a lot. And that's Don Miguel Ruiz. So those are just two of the books that I really love. I'm a huge fan of Think and Grow Rich. 
And I'm actually busy reading it now for the seventh time. I've read it once a year for the last seven years. So really big fan of that one. There's also a book that was written by the founders of GoBundance called Tribe of Millionaires. And that's also, it's kind of a fable type book story, really good book. And then kind of like kicking it up a little bit, there's a book called The Fish That Ate the Whale. And it's about America's banana. Dude, you got to read this book. It is incredible. It is one of the most fascinating books I've ever read. And, you know, it's the story, it's written by Rich Cohen, but it's the story of Samuel Zamuri. And he was a Russian immigrant that came here in the very early 1900s and ended up becoming one of the wealthiest men in America by the 40s, right? So it's really a crazy, uh, really good book. So that's kind of, you know, just some of the recommendations. Lately, I have gone headfirst into kind of the, the Jordan Peterson experience. So I read 12 Rules for Life, which I think is a really great book. I would highly recommend that one. And then I'm busy reading Maps of Meaning right now, which is a super heavy read. So I'm about a third through that one. So let's do this because if you all are like me, my head's spinning and trying to keep up writing notes here (laughs) on these books. If somebody were to dip their toes into the waters of personal growth or personal development for the first time, would you have one you'd recommend as that entry level book or audio book? You know, I think here's, I would read Think and Grow Rich. Okay. Now, here's the thing. The first time I read Think and Grow Rich, I didn't fully understand what I was reading, but I committed to it and I read the book anyway. And keep in mind, that book was written in you know the early 1900s, right? It was published in, in the 1920s. Yeah. Yeah, it was published in the 1920s, but the book had been composed and put together for you know a long time, right? It's not like kind of writing a book today where somebody's just like, hey, I published a book you know last six months. I mean, this was a 25-year project that Napoleon Hill put together. So. But the thing about it is that every time I read it now, and as my understanding increases around the way the mind works and just understanding people at a deeper level and, you know, what's moved my life forward, I get deeper insights into the book every time I read it. So I would start with reading that one and I would recommend reading that one once a year. Just make a practice of it. It's it's an amazing book. I'm with you on that because there are several books that I read at least once a year or every other year at a minimum. Because I think we change so much in any given year. I mean, I look back on the last, and same for you, man, the last five, six years have been just tremendous in terms of growth and different directions and opportunities that come and go and all kinds of friends along the way. So you're changing really quickly. And that's one of the fun things that as coaches, I think you and I get to see that, you know, people who start on that personal growth path have no idea how fast it can take off. So yeah, I recommend listening to Dirk. He's read all of these books. He knows what he's talking about. <laughs> you know, check out Think and Grow Rich. Yeah, before I forget though, I do want to go back. You mentioned the ski business or the business you had in college. And, you know, knowing you and knowing your story, this is a pivotal part of your journey through the ringer in business and life and money and wealth and, you know, finding partners in business, all kinds of things wrapped up and embodied in this element. So could you, for people who don't know you, right? Because a lot of our listeners are from the KW world or, you know, friends who who know you, but I'm going to say the vast majority don't know you. Could you put that in a bottle and explain to them, you know, that you didn't get here, you know, it wasn't a straight line, in other words, to where you are in terms of success today? (laughs) (laughs) You know, I actually, about two weeks ago, I was thinking about this and I actually tallied and I've bought two businesses and started up six. So I've been involved in eight businesses in total. And out of that, three businesses failed. So just to give you an example, we've sold three businesses and still run two today. So just to get that, that just to kind of give a little bit of context of you know what's happened, because it's one of these things that, um, man, learning is just part of the deal. Like, I read an article that most people become millionaires. And, and this statistic is probably busy changing right now just because uh, the way the financial world is changing. But historically, you know, probably for the last 25 years, most people become millionaires in their 50s. And I think part of the reason is that it takes a while to really start building in the way of thinking and the level of experience to take things to the next level. Right? For example, too, and I don't know what the statistic is for the ladies, 
But for men, most men hit their prime in business between 55 and 65 years old. So I think it's one of these things to understand that it takes a while to really start learning the game at a deeper level. It just does. And some people are blessed and, you know, fortunate through opportunities that they learn it faster. And then other people, it just takes a while, you know, but I tell people that my twenties were 100% about making every single mistake that I could make. Like if there's a bad <laughs> financial decision that could have been made, we probably made it in our twenties. So it was kind of like, hey, the twenties were about making all the mistakes. The thirties were about recovering from those mistakes and, and building a foundation. And I'm 39 now. So I'm really looking at my forties as like, hey, that's going to be the decade in my life that I'm really wanting to break out to the next level. So, you know, when you kind of look at and saying like, hey, Dirk, like you've, it looks like you're doing some success. I'm just feeling now like I'm preparing for that next level of success. But I'll go back to the ski shop. And uh, I bought this business when I was 20 years old. And while I was going to school, I was managing the business as well. And, and I worked two jobs. I, I went to school in the mornings, worked at a, an auctioneer for an auctioneer in the afternoons. And then after that, I would go to the ski shop and, you know, work there till from about uh, 5.30 to about 9.30 at night and then weekends as well, and holidays and stuff like that. So after doing that for a couple of years, I was managing it. And then the owner said, hey, do you want to buy the business? We worked out a deal. I bought the business. Right? He made it very easy for me to buy in because I, I, I was super broke. I didn't have any money. But I bought that business and uh, everything went really well for about probably about four years. And then we made some decisions, moved to a different location. And then a lot of stuff started happening. We went through a big drought in the Southwest United States. So when there's not any water, there's not any snow. And by this time we started doing some water sports as well. So we, in the summertime, we did things like, you know, wakeboarding. We even tried to get into kite surfing, which was such a terrible idea being inland. And then, you know, after kind of making all those decisions, investing a lot of money, the business started, the winter business was still okay, but we just got slaughtered in the summer. And by the third year of going through that, man, it actually ended up that one day I was in my shop and this guy shows up with a toolbox and he starts fiddling with my front door. And I'm just like, what the fuck is this guy doing? You know? And, you know, I go to talk to him and right as I'm walking out to talk to him, my landlord walks up and he goes, grab your cash register. We're locking you out of your shop because I was so far behind on rent. And dude, talk about like, you know, just a reality check, right? Of you were there kind of running your business and all of a sudden your landlord shows up with a locksmith and locks you out of your own business. You know, the next morning I remember I woke up and for the first time, you know, in my life, I didn't know what am I supposed to do today? You know, and that kind of started the whole process of, you know, getting access to my inventory again, starting to sell that, everything. But by the time that we got everything wrapped up, I was about $300,000 in debt and no business. And, you know, we were already kind of married at that time. And, you know, there was just kind of this decision of like, hey, we're going to pay everything back. I had about 38 people that I owed money to between banks, different suppliers, vendors, things like that. But the result of that was that, man, the next five, six years of our life was hell. And I was around 28 at that time. And I'd made Kristen a promise that, because I mean, my wife and I, we married for 14 years in January. So coming up and we dated for five years before that. So, I mean, we've been together 19 years and I always promised her, I said, you know, when we get married, she can, or when we have our first child, she can stop working because she always, she's, you know, very easygoing, laid back. And she said, Hey, here's what I want is I want to be a stay at home mom and a wife. Never had ambitions to go kill it in career or anything like that. And I knew that going in. So for me, I wanted to honor that. So what that means is we went from two incomes really to one because the ski shop failed. And then, you know, we right around this time too, we found out we we're pregnant, right? So now it's like, oh crap, we're about to go, you know, lose Kristen's income too, because I made this promise to her. So for me, the only thing that I knew how to do at that time is work really hard. And one thing that I'm fortunate is I'm an immigrant from South Africa. I got here when I was 14 years old. My family immigrated here, grew up farming and ranching. So when it comes to working hard, I'll go toe to toe with anybody just because it's just ingrained in me, like work hard, get up early, work hard, work late, whatever it takes. And I took that understanding into the business world. And, you know, I think like people today would just call that a grinder, right? <laughs> so <laughs> right. I just, you know, went back to work for the auctioneer that I went in college and, you know, he wanted me to learn more about the real estate side of things. So I got my real estate license and started 
doing that. And, but it, it just kind of led me down this path that, you know, fast forward a couple of years. And this is like three years in after the, the shop failed. I'm working six to seven days a week consistently, you know, 80, 90 hour weeks, hardly ever home. I'm not around when Jackson was, you know, a baby when he was one, two years old, a little toddler. Kristen and I at one point almost got a divorce because, I mean, we were just, we were in such financial mess and I was never home, right? I mean, there were literally weeks where I would leave my house before the sun came up and I would get home to my house after the sun went down. Like I, I didn't see my house during the daytime for weeks. And, you know, this just kind of continued and continued until it just got to the point, man, that I, I mean, I just started feeling like a complete failure. And at this point, the question becomes like, is there something wrong with me? Because I feel like I'm an intelligent guy. I feel like I work really hard. I feel like I try to do the right thing and help people. But why am I not able to get ahead? Why can't I get out of this hell hole financially that I'm in? So for us, you know, it just came, kind of came to a head. And for me, you know, one night it actually, you know, it wasn't uncommon for us to get like uh, late notices for our mortgage at the time or even foreclosure notices. Because I mean, for dude, for three or four years, we fought foreclosure off, right? We never filed bankruptcy. We never got foreclosed on. But it was always like, hey, you're one month behind, two months behind, sometimes three months behind. And this one night I got home and there's like a certified letter of like an actual like foreclosure. Like, hey, if you don't pay the full amount plus the late fees and everything in like 30 days, like we're foreclosing on your home. And for me, like that was just really just a, a massive just hit. And keep in mind, man, like, I mean, this is, all of this is literally eight years ago. So. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to highlight for everybody, eight years, it's not that long and it's the longest time, you know, at the same time when you're in the middle of it, because yeah. you said this went on for how long? Three, four years. Yeah. I mean, the shop failed in 2007. And by this time, this is like 2012, right? So, I mean, this is already like five years of like living this hell of working all the time. I mean, just the interest on my payments back then was like 30K a year. And I mean, I wasn't making that much money, right? So I don't even know how we survived it. And I got a ton of stories that will just like make people laugh when I tell them like the kind of crap that we had to do to get by. I mean, it's just, you know, looking back on it now, it just seems like a different world, right? But, you know, for us, Dude, that was the starting point. And here's the crazy thing, like, and, and you'll appreciate this. The night that that whole thing happened, the foreclosure letter, like I'm, it's like 11 o'clock at night and I know that Kristen's going to be asking me about it. So I go online and just start kind of like, how do I make money in 30 days? You know, because by this point, uh, and, and kind of fast forward at this point, uh, Prudential had hired me to start a real estate auction division for them. And I also had my own auction company to sell you know, just household type stuff and, you know, just different kinds of auctions. So, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of running multiple businesses here at this point in my life. And, it, you know, kind of from the outside looking in and may have looked like there was some success, but it was just a shit show. Like it was bad. So I find Tony Robbins online and I've always kind of heard of him, but I'd never actually watched a video or anything like that. And so I watched a video, a YouTube video and another YouTube video and I ended up on his website and he had this program called the ultimate edge. It was still DVDs. Like this is kind of takes you back a little bit, right? I'm laughing too because, well, I was going to say, yeah, I'm laughing because I'm like, it's not that long ago, is it? <laughs> <laughs> My kids don't know what DVDs are. Oh, you man. Know? But, uh, no, they probably do. But so there's this program, it's like 300 bucks and it's the ultimate edge and it's going to transform your life in 30 days. And I'm like, I got 30 days, you know? And, but it's like $300 and I'm like, I don't even have $300 in my bank account. I didn't even have a credit card at that point. And, but it's like, Hey, for three easy payments of, and I'm like, I'll do it. You know? So I buy <laughs> the damn thing and I just start listening to it, Chris. And I get the first disc and I listen to it. And it's so good. I listen to it again. And then I'm like, I don't want to go to the next disc until I listen to the one. So I listen to it again the next day. And I end up listening to every disc. There's like one disc for every day for 30 days. Right? So 30 discs. I ended up listening to every disc like three, four times. And the result of that is that for about two months, like Tony Robbins was just in my ear all day, every day, just reprogramming my mind, just helping me see differently. And we were able, like a, a miracle deal came in. I caught back up on our payments. And then literally about three months after this event, Chris, is when I joined Keller Williams. And they've been trying to recruit me for years. And I was like, you know, just go drink Kool-Aid, like leave me alone. I mean, I was just like not open to it at all, right? 
So, you know, this lady talks to me, Karen Prowl, like she, and she's a freaking rock star in the KW world, right? But she says to me one day, she goes, Dirk, like, Kettle Williams is a company that was built for entrepreneurs like you. Like, you need to check this out. And I was like, okay, I'll, you know, she's just said the right things. And so, and that's kind of kicked off another learning. Now, keep in mind, this is like the very end of 2012, right? And then from there, I was selling about 27 houses a year. And within two years, I went to selling about 120 houses a year and went into leadership with KW and kind of hit the fast forward button. Like, that's kind of where we met. And, you know, and then obviously, End of 2016, I made some really big changes in my life and started Berkflow in 2017. So that's kind of the trajectory, right? But I mean, you know, there is a lot of people that I know that don't know that backstory. So thank you for, you know, just kind of allowing me to share that because I want people to know, man, I was in a messy, messy place for years before I started understanding some of the fundamental things of like what really causes people to move forward. And and I've been learning and studying you know, that ever since then. And today I'm still learning and studying it probably harder today than I ever have before, because I realize that if I want to continue to go to the next level of success in my life, I have to continue to learn. I've got to continue to think differently. I've got to continue to build a better team around me. Right. I mean, there's just, there's just so many factors. And that's why I said like, you know, it's not that success is just over complex, but it's not as simple as just like do this one thing. Right. It's more like a, a formula where several things have to come together. And the cool thing is that the formula looks different for every person, right? Depending on who you are, what you want. That's why, you know, I'm a huge fan again, like, you know, of the kind of work you do, because I believe that everybody should have that guiding force in their life and that person that can help them think through things and make great decisions and hold them accountable. Well, you make it sound so simple. (laughs) (laughs) I guess hire a coach. That's what you got to do, right? (laughs) Well, you know, it's fun because... You know, we are this anomaly in the professional world that, you know, we don't have, you know, when you say you're a coach, people go, oh, like basketball, (laughs) you know, and when you say you're a life coach, people are like, oh, so you're insane and you don't make any money. Okay. (laughs) And then if you say you're a business coach, they're like, oh, so you tell me how to fix my business. And, And, you know, there's no real term for the kind of coaching that you're describing that we do, which is we just help people get out of their own way. And, you know, your story is peppered with opportunities where you you could have stayed in your own way. You could have just foreclosed on the house. You could have gotten the divorce, all of the above. You could have not taken the opportunity. When Dirk said he took the opportunity to be a team leader at KW, what that means is he was the CEO of one of the 750-ish offices around the world. So one of 750 CEOs, Dirk took that role in several different market centers over how many years, three or four years? Yeah. And so as he's going through this and has all these opportunities to grow and learn his own lessons, he's also leading offices full of people, hundreds of people who each have their own drama and their own lives to deal with and their own businesses to fix as well. So he's being modest. He was in this crucible for what sounds like close to a decade and has just broken through the other side of that to an immense level and made it look easy. And, you know, Todd was on the podcast a few episodes before yours is going to come out. <laughs> oh, dude, Todd is so awesome. Oh, he's my favorite. You know, he's so, he's just so happy to be alive that everything else is like, Hey, if we're not dead, it's all okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but shoot, what was I going to say? He was talking about how, you know, we just, we get to this point where it's either learn and grow or stop. And he said he was going to do something different when life got really stressful and business got really stressful. He goes, I was going to do something different or I was going to do something totally different. And that's when he decided to get some help and get some leverage. And you've kind of done that over time as well. So what I want to dovetail this with how I want to connect the dots here is you have an immense amount of what we would call leverage in our world. Leverage You know, in the KW world, they train you that leverage is people, systems, and tools. Uh No single human can do enough on their own. So in other words, if you want to do something remarkable in life and business, you're going to have to involve some help. And, you know, for entrepreneurs, it usually comes in the form of people. If that's not the case, we get some kind of system or process involved. And if we can't do it that way, we'll find some kind of tool. So we always talk about leverage in form of people, systems, and tools, and you have an immense amount of leverage in your different businesses right now. Could you talk about some of the lessons you've learned? You know, you learned some hard lessons, man. So what I'd love to do is save 
people some time and stress and doing it the hard way and give them the, you know, a gift from your wisdom and experience to avoid that in terms of really creating great leverage in their world. Yeah, I think everything that comes down, and you kind of touched on this a while ago, but Steve Jobs once said that truly extraordinary things are never built by one person. They're always built by a team of people. So for me, that is the foundation of leverage. And I get that, look, sometimes it's a tool, sometimes it's a process. But for me, if you have the right people, they can accelerate everything else. So for me, the biggest thing is if you truly want higher level of success in your life as a business person, you have to learn how to get into business with the right people. Like that's the foundation of it. And, and that's the work that we specialize in in Workflow. But I think like that's it is that you have to, and kind of what you said a while ago, you have to figure out how to get out of your own way, get into business with really great people and then help them get out of their own way to help them move towards what they want. And the level of skill around that that you have in your life is gonna become one of the greatest accelerators you know, for yourself. And obviously, I mean, I, I think I'm probably talking more to people that want to build larger businesses that are going to require having additional people in their life. Because I know that there's a lot of solo entrepreneurs or people that have really amazing businesses that have very few people involved or a VA or something like that. But the challenge is scalability at the highest level is always going to involve people. Like technology will get you to a certain level. Systems and processes will get you a certain level. But if you really want to go bigger, you're going to have to learn how to get into business with people. So for me, that's just a different study. It's a different area to build skill around. And what I would highly recommend that if you feel like you were just tapped out with what you can do, if you feel like, look, there's just not enough hours in the day, if you continually kind of have this environment of confusion in your life of like, what's most important right now, or crap, I forgot I've got to do that. I mean, just this mode of like feeling like you're running all the time. It's probably a prime example that you need to get some of the right kind of people in your life. And, you know, whether that's that you have three people or 30 or 300, like those things can still show up. So it's just a continual learning process. So I imagine there are dozens of people listening to this the day this episode comes out going, oh, I need your help. I need to know how to find the right people. I got to get rid of the people I've got. They're the wrong people. I know that, but I can't get rid of those people until I find the right people. And I don't know how to find the right people, so I'm stuck. Can you shine some light on that when people get to that point in their business? I think that one of the first things we always tell people that we work with is don't just get rid of the people that you have because sometimes, yes, you could just be in business with the wrong person or sometimes you're in business with the right person that's on the wrong seat on the bus or sometimes you're in business with the right person on the right seat of the bus except you haven't learned how to really activate them or help them go to the next level. So for us, it's always one. I think the, the most powerful thing is that somebody can recognize and say, okay, this is an area that I need help in. And it's a different way of thinking about things because Chris, like you know, it's like most people, they focus on building skill around some sort of a technical skill or some sort of a sales skill. And they're like, oh, if I want to make more money, I just need to get better at doing this or I just need to sell more of this. And that works to a certain extent, but it's usually a one-to-one -one equation with money and time. So if you really want to go to what we call like a multiplier equation, where it's not just about working more to get more done, then you have to succeed through hiring the right people. And it's a different skill. It's a different mindset. It's a different way of showing up. And like, you know, that's why it's like, look, if you look at top level CEOs and what they get paid, what they get paid usually is completely out of proportion to what anybody else in the organization gets paid, right? If you look at the whole C team, Sometimes the whole C team together doesn't get paid as much as the CEO does. And the reason is that typically high-level CEOs have learned how to really find the right people for the right positions and activate them and truly succeed through them, right, with them and through them. And I think that is a different type of skill set because, you know, we see this all the time in businesses that somebody is really good at something, they get promoted to a leadership level and they start failing. And it's because, okay, they haven't gone through the process of understanding you know, the skill, the understanding, the mindset, everything that goes around that. So, you know, if, if somebody is there and just kind of at that place, I think the first thing that you got to do is you got to seek clarity and really look at like plot your org chart, you know, in front of you and look at your whole organizational structure, go through each person and, you know, ask yourself like, well, number one is if you're looking at somebody on your org chart, ask yourself the question, how well do I actually really know them? 
do I know what's really important to them? Do I know what's important to them and their family? Do I know where they want to be in life in three years from now? Because as a leader, if you don't understand those kind of answers from that person, then there's no way that you can actually really help them to succeed. You can't really lead them. Right. If you don't understand those kind of things and what's important to a human being and how to move them towards the outcomes that are important to them, then you're kind of leading by force. You're not leading by truly helping somebody walk their journey out. So the first thing is like really get clear about that. The next thing is trigger some conversations with your existing people. Just sit down with them and just say the first thing I always recommend is if you sit down with somebody that you work with that you don't really know at the deepest level and say, hey, I just want to apologize to you. Because, you know, we've actually been working together for two years, four years, seven years, whatever it is. And I just realized, like, I don't truly know you at the deepest level outside of what we do every day, you know, working together. You know, can you tell me a little bit about who you are, like where you really came from, what you're about? Like, what do you really want to be able to achieve and accomplish in your life? And, you know, find out why those things are important to that person. Because when you start getting somebody to really talk about authentically who they are and what's important to them, that's where they're going to start unlocking like their potential within your organization. And there's a whole process that goes around this. But I mean, as you get to know your people, then you may find that, yes, it's just not the right fit. We got to get out of business with this person. It's actually good for them and it's good for us. Or it's like, hey, we really need to move this person to this area or Hey, we need to put this person on a development path or, you know, hey, we need to hire some new people, whatever that is. But without even understanding who your people are at the core level and what they're about and what they want, it's going to be really hard for you to pull them together as a team and create alignment. Man, that was brilliant. And I really want to know how you would respond to somebody who says, I don't have time to deal with all that. I don't have time to sit down with everybody and, you know, pour love on them and these long-winded conversations about what do you really want? I don't have time for that. What would you say to them? Yeah, I would just say, I mean, if you don't have time for that, like strap in to be a grinder for the rest of your life and get ready to kiss financial freedom goodbye. (laughs) I would be that blunt about it. I'm laughing because we both know that's the cost. That is the cost. Yeah. Yeah. They will get what they tolerate, which is poor performance and poor results and rinse and repeat every day until they, you know, fall into their early grave. Chris, you're right. Look, I mean, that's why you got to think differently. It's a different mindset. It's a different skill set. It's a different way of viewing the world. But here's what I learned. I tried the grinder approach and it didn't work out so well for me. And I mean, today I don't work as hard as I used to. And the things that I'm able to do today in very shorter chunks of time lead to astronomically bigger outputs in my life. So for me, it's just a process of like, I want to continue to learn how to do more of that. 100%. I think that is part of why I decided to start this podcast, because I I realized that people like you have so many ways to, like you said earlier, multiply the force that somebody's putting into their business. And that with a few elegant brushstrokes, we can make their life more productive, less stressful, more financially sound, like all kinds of things, just because they don't simply have the awareness of it. And I'm, I mean, right now, as I'm saying this, I'm thinking about, you know, two weeks ago, I had a 20 minute conversation with somebody that turned into, you know, more business than I could put together in 10 houses sold that would have taken me a hundred hours to close. Uh, You know, it's 20 minutes of my time. And it was just, it, it wasn't that I wouldn't have happily done that work five years ago. You know, I would have, gladly reach for it. I just didn't know it was possible. I just had no awareness of it. So let me put a a bow on this. For people who don't know what they don't know about getting amazing leverage through people in their organization to succeed at a scalable level, to experience success and wealth building at a scalable level, what would be the first step in them figuring out what to do? Yeah, I think the first thing is like make a decision that that's going to be what you start studying and learning about. There's no silver bullet to this. And it's a new journey that you're beginning. So the first decision is just making the decision to go on the new journey to say, look, if I want to learn more about leverage and wealth building, I have to commit that, you know, for the next three, four, five years, I'm going to read books about it. I'm going to listen to podcasts about it. I'm going to go to conferences about it. I'm going to talk to people about it. I'm going to hand a higher coach to help me work through it, right? 
it's the process of truly saying that, look, if that's what's important to me, that's what I'm going to turn my time and effort and energy to and start figuring it out on how to go. Because there literally there is no silver bullet. You know, some of my mentors are extremely successful. And we we're talking about one of them to somebody else uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I'm like, people forgot the 35 years that he put in his time and effort and energy to even start really building the momentum. You know, so it's one of those things that if you're going to commit to it, just make the decision and then start aligning your actions, you know, with that decision, like align your actions of what you're going to be reading. I mean, if you're going to be screwing around on Facebook a lot or like binge watching Netflix instead of reading a book about it, then it's like your actions and your decision don't align. There's no congruency. Right. And then there's no power. And unfortunately, that's a lot of people out there is they make these decisions, but then there's no congruency in you know, their walk and their talk don't match, right? So you got to get your walk and talk to match. And the way they do that is you the level of activity you take day in and day out. Well said. I'm excited for this last question because I've wanted to ask you for a while and I, I just haven't. I don't know why. I just haven't. You are a driven dude. You, you know, clearly know how to work hard. You know how to build. You know how to scale. You know how to help people build and scale. You could do anything on earth you wanted to, <laughs> which you've proven by climbing, you know, 10 or so big mountains and you know, 20 or so small mountains. And, you know, you ought to see this guy's goal sheet. It makes you really reevaluate your own goals when you look at, at Dirk's vision board. <laughs> but, you know, I, what I would love for people to sink their teeth into is not just that it's possible because, you know, we with Instagram and Facebook, we have lots of examples of entrepreneurs who are out here doing it. You know, they're pulling it off. They're finding a way to make it happen. We know it's possible, but we don't always know is why. When you're a dude who could do whatever you wanted, wherever you wanted, at this point, you could build wealth in any industry you wanted to enter. Why do you do what you do? I think for me, because I was in that place, I was that business owner, that small business owner that had dreams of really doing something for my family and, you know, building a, a great life for them. And yet it almost took everything from me. And when I was able to get out of that and really transform our lives, you know, as I was kind of in the, in the KW world, right? Because, I mean, the, the last office we ran, I mean, it was, you know, out of 800 offices worldwide, I mean, we were within the top three to four offices worldwide. I mean, it was a huge office, lots of kind of status and prestige with that kind of role and a lot of accolades and kind of getting pats on the back. But I mean, I just I felt a void within myself. And I just, at that moment, realized like, man, like my path is not this. It's, I want to go back out to, you know, those entrepreneurs that don't have any help, those people that are building businesses and they're just not able to get home to see their families. They're stressed financially. They're losing their health. You know, they built a business, you know, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to go find those people and just share with them everything that I had learned to turn my life around. And, you know, when we started Berkflow, I walked away from a lot of opportunity because, I mean, I had ownership in that office. I had ownership in a title company, walked away from all of that because it hadn't invested yet. And, you know, we came back to Texas. We had very little, right? I'd say nothing, but I mean, we had very little and put it all on the line to build Berkflow. You know, now we're about to wrap up our fourth year and it has been one of the most amazing blessings because, of the businesses that we've been able to work with and the people that we've been able to help and how their lives have transformed and how our lives have transformed in that process as well. And really that's it, man. Like, I mean, we, when I started Berkflow, I kind of put this really big goal out there and I said, we're going to change the lives of 25 million people, but it's not about us touching 25 million people personally, right? It's about us working with that entrepreneur that has big dreams. And that person ends up hiring a hundred people, you know, and, you know, that's 400 family members, right? And that's, you know, people in the community. And by working with people that want to elevate as leaders and pour into others, you know, that's how we're making our mark. And that's one thing that's important to us is we won't work with just anybody. We will only work with leaders that we believe if we empower that leader, that they are going to truly take care of their people, impact their people's lives in really powerful ways and, you know, be great leaders in the community, you know, so, for us, it's just a, a mission because every time we can help somebody, if they can help somebody else, then it may lead to one less divorce. It may lead to, you know, one less person having to die early. It may lead to, you know, one parent having a better relationship with their child, right? And 
those are the things that I was on a path to losing all of those things. And I just feel so grateful that things were able to turn around. And I've had so many amazing people on my journey that have poured into me. So for me, it's just about, you know, continuing the work and helping others do the same. Well said, brother. If I was one of those people you just described who is desperately in need of your help, where should they find you? Bergflow.com. Nice and simple. B-E-R-G flow, F-L-O-W dot com, right? That's it, man. And it's the only Berg flow out there. So if you even get close on Google, you're going to find Dirk. <laughs> <laughs> Real quick, let's tell people why you named it Berg flow. Yeah. Thank you so much for asking that, man. I love this question. So when I started the company, I wanted to be very particular. I wanted to build a company that I would be in love with because I don't know if anybody's ever done this, but I've actually built businesses before that I ended up hating the businesses that I built. And I don't, <laughs> that's such a weird thing to say, but like, it's like, I hate your logo and where you work and the people you work with. Like I've actually been the guy that's done that. So um, I, I wanted to if design I a company. Back, I would change mine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I wanted to be particular about everything, even what I named it. And so when I thought about this, I was like, man, I want a name that means something. It's got to have meaning. And so I looked at, okay, what is Bergflow going to, or what is the company going to be about before I did that? And I said, look, I really want a company that's going to really reward us in a really big way for us, our family, our team members, our clients, everything. Like it's got to be a company that's truly worthwhile. So I knew that I was looking for, okay, how do we access those rewards? And, you know, it's based on opportunities, right? If you can capitalize on opportunity, you get the reward unlocked. But what creates opportunity is challenge. And that's kind of the word that I settled on is, okay, we are going to have to be willing to take on challenges that most people are not willing to take on. So for me, I looked for a representation of, okay, what represents challenge? For me, it was a mountain, right? So I'm, I'm very, like Bergfold is a very kind of outdoor brand type company. And I said, okay, it's a mountain. So I knew that was needing to be present. And then about five years before I did this, this is probably like 2013 or so, I watched a documentary called Happy. And I would highly recommend that documentary. But one of the things they talked about is like, what are the five essential things for to experience more joy and happiness in your life? And, you know, the other four were kind of things like, you know, okay, hey, that makes sense. But one of the things was flow. And it was uh, this thing called this, the state of flow. So this is the, really the first time I'd heard about, okay, what is the state of flow? And it's a state that you enter where time ceases to exist. You're not worried about anything. You're not thinking about what you got to do next Tuesday. You are fully immersed in the moment that presents itself. And people get into flow different ways. So for some people, it could be skydiving. For some people, it could be reading a book. For some people, it's knitting, you know, having a conversation, laying on the beach, whatever it is, right? I said, hey, I want a flow to be in what we do. And so I brought flow in and then it was like, okay, mountain flow. And then I said, that doesn't sound good. So I was like, ah, what about berg flow, right? Because I'm from South Africa and bad is the Afrikaans word for mountain. So think of like iceberg, ice mountain, right? So that's where uh, Bergflow came from. And we just wanted to create a company that we really want to challenge ourselves at a high level. We want to challenge our clients at a high level. And we want to do it in a way that we love what we do day in and day out. You guys, I've known Dirk for years. He's not just selling this. This is how he thinks. This is how he operates. And this is how he trains people every day to to build their life and business. And, it, and it's such a pleasure to hear it straight from you. So thanks for the time. And I'm certain I'm going to get all kinds of feedback that you've inspired somebody to take action today, whether it's to get out of debt or, you know, to save somebody, like you said, to, you know, save some time and stress in your business so that you can prevent one divorce or one bankruptcy or, you know, even one unhappy day. So thanks for the great work you're doing in the world, man. Chris, appreciate it, man. It's been a pleasure to be on here with you. You know, it's always fun just to catch up with you and get on a conversation. So it felt just kind of like a normal conversation that we would have anyway. So I appreciate that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Except for maybe an hour shorter because we tend to get long winded. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, um, you know, as always, my encouragement is not to just turn this off and go back to your daily grind, to do something different, to actually take action, to change something today, whether it's just one simple thing or shifting a thought 
Or if it's like Dirk said, you know, he had this reckoning where he sat down and it was time to invest $300 into some kind of coaching program. Do something different after listening to Dirk's story so that you can start to experience that growth journey that's taken him to those high levels of success for yourself. And as always, tune in next time because we have another guest that you're going to want to hear from. (laughs) So, all right, everybody, thanks. And we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Relentless Growth. If you're ready to start leading your life and business with a new level of passion, purpose, and relentless growth, go to goodmancoachinginc.com where you can join the email list and sign up for a coaching consultation right now.